1.5 thousand years ago. So he's got a, a big range to work in there. Okay, uh, he's working with with uh, uh, sites in South Georgia, and he's going to talk about one of those in the swamps down there with all the bugs uh, in just a few minutes here. Uh, but this is a long time interest of his. He's worked not only here in Georgia but also in Africa. Uh, dealing with very early uh, hominid forms. I think I've probably said enough. If you're ready to start, I'll let you have That's it. perfect. I didn't hear any of it. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for um, having me. So we got that thing at the top, so just look around it, I guess. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate the invite. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago about African stuff. Um, this one's going to be quite different. Um, but... You know, I start by sort of introducing stuff, and throughout the presentation, I talk about collaborators and students. And so, if I do this correctly, you will think that I've done nothing and <laughs> that they have done everything. And so, hopefully, that will come across. Um, to start, we good there. I wanted to start. Um, this was my mentor, uh, Dr. Al Mead. He gave a talk here uh, a few years ago. His daughter Melanie was a uh, member of Bragg, and so she was very in archaeology, so he came up and gave a talk, and so I started working with him in, I think, 2003, and so a lot of the stuff, the initial things that I'm going to talk about were stuff that he and I did, but the talk's sort of going to focus on um, most of what me and students have been doing over the past five years. So first, we're going to talk about the late Pleistocene. Um, just, I know that it's a deeper time period than, uh oh just, just go, we're just going to go. Um, we're going to talk about the late Pleistocene. I realize that's a deeper time period than a lot of you are probably used to thinking about, um, but so I wanted to introduce that. Then we're going to talk about theoretical things. So what is paleoecology? Why do we care about it? What does it mean to archaeology? What does it mean to ecosystems? Then we're going to talk about coastal Georgia paleo landscapes. Then stable isotopes. A lot of my students have done a lot of stable isotope work. Um, we're not going to get too deep into it, uh, but hopefully the patterns will make sense. And then we're going to close it out. Um, okay. So this is geologic time scale. Um, under this, you well, there's a place of scene right there. Um, this map or this depiction says that it starts at 1.8. It's recently been moved back to 2.8 because a lot of stuff that happened in Africa. But it spans from around 2.8 million to 10,000 years. Um, and lots of important things happen. Most of hominin evolution is encompassed within this period. Um, so you arose in this, in this period, and um, that's why a lot of people think about it. But um, the late Pleistocene, the way that I think about it, the dates shift every now and again, but really just sort of the last 100,000 years is what we're thinking about. Um, the end of the Pleistocene, there is a significant extinction. It does not make the big five extinctions that you're probably most familiar with. Most people are familiar with the one that happened at the end of Cretaceous. This is when the dinosaurs go extinct. Um, but the end of the Pleistocene Although a more minor extinction event, comparatively, you do see approximately 70% of mega mammals during this period going extinct, right? And so those are animals over 44 kilograms. And so these would be things like mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, your classic sort of fauna that you probably saw in the movie Ice Age, right? All of those animals are going to go extinct during this period. Um, the most representative sample that we have from this period is from the La Brea Tar Pits. You guys are probably familiar with the La Brea Tar Pits. They're in downtown Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Um, this is an actual picture of the Tar Pits, but um, lots and lots and lots of animals uh, died in these Tar Pits, and then they basically became entrapped, and, and, and eventually that brings in a lot of carnivores. And so these are all dire wolf skulls that were collected from the Brea Tar Pits. And so when people think about the late Pleistocene, they're thinking about these groups of animals. And this is probably the most representative sample that we have. Um, La Brea is unique in terms of the number of carnivores. Most people think it was because 
if you're just a normal carnivore and you see a mammoth or a, a large piece of meat trapped in tar, you're probably going to go investigate and start eating it. And then you also get trapped. And so they just these huge columns of tar filled sediments that have tons and tons of carnivores within them. Um, but that's what most people think about when they um, think about the late Pleistocene. When we think about late Pleistocene extinctions, it's really complicated. <laughs> and lots of people have attributed um, all of these animals going extinct to human influence, so humans moving into novel ecosystems and killing them, um, or restructuring the landscape. A lot of people link it to climate. Some people link it to the interaction of both. Um, there haven't been really any, in my opinion, very convincing answers over the last, you know, decade, uh, because I think it's probably pretty complex. In some places, it was probably climate, some places it was probably humans, and there's, as with everything in paleontology, it's never really simple. Um, but this is a depiction of a global distribution, and so you see at around 11.5 or 10,000, you start seeing a lot of these animals just no longer on the landscape, and then those landscapes transform. Um, the big just to plug Africa a little bit, the, the big challenge to this whole situation is that Africa still has a lot of mega mammals, but Africa was also the place where humans were humans first. And so the question is, is why is it that when they move out of Africa, you start seeing these extinctions, but within Africa, a lot of these species remain. Um, so that's a big problem. Lots of people are working on it. Um, nonetheless, it was heterogeneous and attributed to a lot of things. And so, what we want to do is figure out how we can use fossil deposits in southeastern North America to contribute to this discussion because we're not going to solve it. We don't claim that we're going to solve it, but we just want to add to the data and try to understand. It. Um, but before you do that, I think it's important, and as, as, as students and professors all know, you need some sort of theoretical underpinning before you start just digging holes and thinking about what you're gonna find. The way that I think about paleo landscapes, I think about them in the same way that this guy, Eugene Odom, um, another Georgia fellow, thought about ecosystems. And so he thought about ecosystems as these very interconnected things. The challenge with doing that in the fossil record is that a lot of the things that you would want to see are invisible because they have been erased by taphonomy and they've been erased by sediments and all that sort of stuff. But I think what Odom provides is, is just some sort of structure that we can begin to think about. And so if you take that quote and you break it down into its parts, an ecosystem is a unit of biological organization. And so although they do seem like they're haphazardly put together, sometimes it is organized in a sort of functional way. You take the physical environment, so topography, climate, all these abiotic factors, these non-living elements, and you link them to the organisms living in that area, including plants. Most people don't like to talk, most paleontologists don't like to talk about plants, but I think plants are extremely important. And then you talk about how all those things interact with each other on that abiotic landscape, and then energy flows through it. And so with what I'm gonna talk about today, we really start with the physical environment, what it looked like during the late Pleistocene on coastal Georgia. And then we layer in all these animals and we try to figure out how they interact with each other. What did they eat? Who ate who? Who did not eat anything? That type of thing. And so this, these are pictures of hominins. I had to throw hominins in there at some point. But when most paleontologists and paleoecologists thought or think about these types of questions, it's often in sort of an isolated way to where some people only think about fauna in the environments, right? And so they're thinking about these ungulates live in this particular place, and so it must mean this, right? If they eat grass, there must have been a whole heck of a lot of things there, right? Then there are other folks that think about, okay, which species were scavengers? Which species were... Um, you know, just hyper carnivores, those types of things. And so that's what they think about. And that's how they think about the ecosystem. Then other people only think about plants. Those people are few and far between, but there are people that are interested in the paleobotanical record. And I think that those questions are probably some of the most important ones that we can have in the, in the fossil record. 
But when you take all of these and put them together, you can finally figure out some sort of way that the system is working together. And that is what we've tried to do with the Brunswick locality that I'm going to talk about today. And so when we look at let's go, when we look at coastal Georgia, I'm sure all of you have been to coastal Georgia at, at some point. This is what it looks like in a lot of places. Marshlands, you know, these sort of isolated live oak forests within marshlands. And so how is it that we can take information from this place to try to understand paleo landscapes? And so fortunately, sediments around Brunswick, Georgia, so just about an hour south of Savannah, have sediments there that preserve a lot of the record of the late Pleistocene. And so what we do or have done over the past three to five years is we have led new ex excavations, we've done a lot of stable isotope work, and we've just started doing a lot of paleo landscape modeling during the Pleistocene. And so what we're trying to do is just like Odom would hopefully suggest, as you build that abiotic story, and then you layer on animals and plants, and you try to figure out how everything works together. So these are LIDAR data. And so being archaeologists, you guys are all probably familiar with LIDAR data. You basically just remove all the vegetation and look at topographic changes. And so here... This is, so modern Brunswick, if you were in downtown Brunswick, which I would encourage you to go to, it's, really, it's a nice place these days, is right here, right? And so you see that Brunswick proper sits on this ancient barrier island called the Princess Anne Terrace. And that Princess Anne Terrace is about 100,000 years. And so that island was, that barrier island was formed exactly the same way that some place like St. Simon's or Jekyll or any of those places were formed today. It was just sea levels were higher, it puts it in, and now St. Simon's is over in this fault, right? And so that deposit is about 100,000 years old. Next to it is called a Pamlico Barrier Island. It is older, and so that could be 150 or so, right? The thing that we are interested in is the space in between. And so you'll see this green area is lower topography. And so that's an estuary environment in between two ancient barrier islands. And within that estuary environment is where we find all the fossils associated with this project. And so sea level during the time that these, this estuary was formed was probably much lower and it was probably much farther out. And so this created this low environment where water was sort of held and animals probably came to and then eventually died in that space. We have a site called Clark Quarry this is what Almi, my advisor, and I started digging in the early 2000s. And this is the one that he came and talked to you guys about a couple of years ago and brought fossils. I don't have any fossils. He's better, better than I am, of course. But that is a site called Clark Quarry. The reason that that site was found was because there is something called the brunswick Altamaha Canal that was dug in between these two ancient barrier islands because of the low topography. And the goal was to unite the Altamaha River in the north and the Turtle River in the south, and they were gonna be moving cotton barges in between that area. Unfortunately, it was never functional, but as we'll talk about in a minute, during its construction in the, in the mid 1800s, they found fossils as they were digging the canal, right? And so, You'll see this part is the canal right here. You can see it's sort of running up through here. Um, this is the Brunswick Airport, which you can see here. Um, down. But the point is, is this whole space contains this ancient estuary and, um, environment. And you can probably see it here, but you see these darker areas of lower topography. Those were me meandering late Pleistocene streams. Right? And so we've dated a lot of those, and we know they date to around 60,000 years. And so the beauty of something, and I have another figure where I've sort of traced them out. The beauty of this is, is you can use these data to sort of pinpoint where you should be digging for fossils. Right, So fossils are going to get deposited on point bars and rivers, because that's where the energy is lowest. Animals go there, they get covered up really quickly. And so this is the first sort of step in our paleo landscape, which we'll talk about. Um, this is what the canal looks like today. Um, it is, um, a few of my students can, can note that it is not the most nice place to work. Um, 
It is hot, it is muddy, um, it's tidally influenced, and so water goes up and down throughout the day. Um, I have seen alligators in it in the past. Um, last time we were there, we saw a tremendous eel of some sort. It was about this long. Okay. Anyway, so it's variably deep. And so um, typically, you know, the canal from the edges of the canal down to the bottom is probably 10 feet. But water level is low during certain portions of the day. And so the water may too, but it goes up and down. Um, so in 1838, construction begins. This local naturalist called James Hamilton Cooper uh, is just sort of around when this is happening. And when construction folks start finding fossils, they called Cooper because he was sort of the local naturalist, the local Darwin. And so he goes down and he pinpoints seven or eight points in the construction of this canal in which they're finding um, Pleistocene vertebrates. Birds. And so these are things like mammoths, mastodons. Um, they called something a hippo. Clearly, it was not a hippo. Hippos are other side of the world, but they thought it was a hippo. It was not. Anyways, these big mammals are finding. <clears throat> shortly thereafter, in 18, um, he starts shortly after 1838, but Sir Charles Lyell is in North America. And so I'm sure you all know Lyell, modern geology. Um, he takes two trips to North America. He describes um, sediments across the Southeast. During his first trip, he comes into Savannah. He goes up to Charleston, comes down to Brunswick because Cooper called him, or but didn't call him, but talked to him, um, or got word to him that they were finding these fossils. And he comes and he um, investigates the area, describes it a bit, but then he goes on down to New Orleans and leaves. But the important thing is, is from the brunswick Altamont Canal, a single mammoth molar becomes the type specimen of Mammuthus columbi, which is the mammoth that is not the woolly mammoth, the one that occurred basically from the Great Lakes down into Mexico, right? It was an extremely um, abundant mammoth, um, Lots of the sites that you see out in um, the central U.S. or even, you know, up into the Rocky Mountains, those are not woolly mammoths, those are mammoths discovered. But this was the first one that was discovered and named, uh, and it was named in 1857 by a guy named Falconer, who was in Europe. So the canal has added importance because it's the tight locality and it's very widespread species. Okay, so this is Clark Quarry. Um, this is the, lo the locality that Al Mead talked about. Um, it's a single locality. Uh, it so this is the canal right here. And it started back, we started digging back in here and we moved forward, uh, you know, for now it's probably over to here, but we found the remains of lots of large mammals, including Mammoth's columbi and bison ladder fronds, as well as tons of small mammals. Um, we found recently, we were going through the collection, we found we have a black bear molar from the area. Um, we also found some deer remains. Um, a lot of, uh, we have a capybara too from there. And so that would have been a South American migrant up north. Um, interestingly, we have not found any giant ground sloth. Uh, giant ground sloth was also found in the construction of the canal and at several other localities, but we haven't found it. Um, so that's that locality. Uh, I included this because this is me as an undergraduate <laughs> screen watching at that site. Um, so, you know, I started on the low end of the totem pole, I guess, but um, that's me. Here's me. This is how we had to move things back to the site through the swamp. Um, sometimes it was so uh, high we had to float the wheelbarrow across the swamp. Uh, there were alligators in that. You know, Al didn't really care, but it's fine. <laughs> the things you do. Um, you're trying to recruit future archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> Try it's fun. You know, you got a story to tell. Yeah. Um, but these are some of the things that we find. So this is a picture of bi a reconstruction of bison ladder front. So same genus as you would see in Yellowstone, just a different species, much much larger. Had these giant horns. Um, the horn span on them were something like seven feet. Right, so it was it was huge. 
And I should mention, we also have a complete skull of bison ladder fronds from Clark Quarry with the horn core still attached. Um, this is a, a picture in Nebraska of a reconstruction of a Mammothus columbi herd. Um, these are Mammothus columbi vertebrae. And so likely from a single individual, they all articulate together. Um, we have lots of other, we have a complete foot from one of them. We have um, remains of a juvenile. We have juvenile jaw bones, and juvenile tusks. Uh, we have adult teeth. This is a bison ladder fronds vertebrae, but the thing to note, if, if you're familiar with looking at a lot of fossils or even so archaeological stuff, these are extremely complete. And so you see that, you know, all of these vertebrae, so that vertebrae is probably that big. It still has all of the processes attached to it. They haven't been busted off. It hasn't been rolled in a river. It hasn't, none of that has happened. Interestingly, we have tons of small mammals as well. Um, this we'll talk about in a moment, but we've done a lot of um, wet sieving and really concentrating on a lot of the small mammal community. And so we found a lot of stuff. This is work that um, Mary, who is here, who is one of my students, did. Um, I wanted to show you guys this because when you look at, these are all sites, I think there are about 350 localities across the Southeast. Um, so this is Florida, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Tennessee, right? <laughs> so these are 350 localities. This is the age distribution of those localities in Southeastern America. And so you'll see that most of those sites are sub 20,000. So this is your archaeological record. And so this includes archaeological and paleontological localities. And so you see that they're all clustered in here, right? And so the other interesting thing that happens is the older it gets, the more uncertain we are about the age of a particular locality. And so a lot of these sites are radiocarbon dated. And as we all know about radiocarbon dating, it it has a point where it sort of drops off. Now it's 50-ish, 55,000 years. Um, our site, we're going to talk about dating in a minute, is most likely somewhere around 60,000 years old based on OSL and IRSL dating. Um, but I think it's interesting because if for nothing else, it says that we don't really know very much <laughs> about the Southeast during this period prior to human arrival in the region because there just aren't a lot of sites. So the uniqueness of this site is hopefully it fills some sort of gap in that pressure. Okay. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to think about this as a paleo landscape. And so when we started excavating at Clark Quarry, we were pulling tons of fossils out of the ground. We were doing spatially resolved geology in that particular space. But what we wanted to start doing... Um, you know, starting around 2018, is try to figure out a little more about why these fossils were in this spot on the landscape. Because we could figure that out and we could predict where we would find them in other places in that landscape. Because we know Cooper and Lyell found them at multiple localities. And so we were only dealing with this one locality. And so what we were trying to do is start building out that paleo landscape model. And that's what we've been doing for the past five years or so. And so this is work of Chris Simonak, um, who is a sedentary geologist in IESA at UNG, um, down on the Gainesville campus. He did his dissertation up in Virginia, looking at a lot of barrier islands and how they form, how they move, transgress, regress, all this other stuff. And so it was, I had no idea that he did that when I first got here. I just went down to talk to him and he was like, yeah, I did a lot of coastal sort of stuff. And so he coming out of this project has been huge because he could think about these paleo barrier islands, how they were created, um, how water could sort of move through them, that sort of thing. And so this is a blown out image of what you saw earlier, but this is the Princess Anne barrier island. This is the Pamlico barrier island. This is the Altamaha River, right? And so early on, when we started looking at it, we have a, we hopefully soon we'll be dating this. So like Darien, if you've been to Darien, Darien is up on top of this barrier island up here. Interestingly, it does look like those two have been sort of cut out by the Altamaha River. We're not certain we're going to get dates on both sides to try to sort of figure that out. 
but he's been really instrumental in sort of figuring out how the physical environment was shaped. And so if we look back at this figure, this is an area in which we've sort of traced out some of these paleo river areas. And so what we're doing now is we're going to some of these places and actually testing them. We're doing test pits, we're doing cores, we're doing lots of things. This is what the site of Clark Quarry looks like. And so you have this clay layer, you have a carbonate layer, which is interesting for a lot of reasons. Then you have this sandy, flu low energy fluvial area. And then down here, you have these barrier island sands. And so that suggests that this river is sort of cutting in to that ancient barrier island and sort of sitting on top of it. And interestingly, we have, we did, these are IRSL dates, which you're probably familiar with in the archaeology world. Um, it's a luminescence type dating that basically looks at sand grains and the last time they were exposed to radiation. Um, they don't align with their radiocarbon dates. And so radiocarbon dates on bones directly adjacent to these IRSL dates are around 20,000, whereas the IRSL dates are around 60,000. Huge problem. But we are sorting it out now, um, both depositionally and with lots of fancy dating type things. Um, when you compare the two, these are the IRSL dates, these are the radiocarbon dates. And so you see that they sort of cluster around this sort of 20,000 year period, but IRSL is way back at 60. Um, we do, when you do use those dates, you, you can constrain it to around 2,000 years. Most people think that it's probably that the fossils were moved or there's some sort of bleaching or some sort of thing. Um, we have the radiocarbon and IRSL people sort of arguing about it now. And hopefully they're going to come up with a solution pretty soon. Um, okay. So these are two other students that have worked on it, Parker and Todd. And so Todd is doing a really interesting study of the taphonomy of the small mammals. And so he's trying to figure out whether they've passed through the gut of like an owl um, to figure out how they were sort of clustered in that area. Um, Parker described all of the rodents. There's something like 20 different species of rodents from this one specific area. And for somebody like me, that's really valuable as a paleoecologist because it tells you something about the very localized environment. Most small mammals live and die with a really small range. Compared to a mammoth or a bison, it can sort of take off over vast areas. Um, they tell you something really, really interesting about the local environment. And so this is a this is a Florida bog lemming. That's what they look like. And this is the jaw that we found um, in the site. And so you see that it's extremely well preserved for a, you know, late places in the fossil. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to talk a little bit about stable isotopes. I don't want to get too far into the weeds <laughs> of isotopes. Um, but I'm sure that you've heard of them and probably talked about, I know people have talked about them in the past. Generally, you can think of the plant world um, in a very general way as having C3 and C4 plants. C3 plants are trees, C4 plants are grasses. It's much more complicated than that, but let's just go with that. There are things like cacti that sort of fall in between. They have a carbon isotope distribution that is distinct from each other. And so if you run ice carbon isotopes on C3 and C4 plants, they do not overlap with each other. When an animal eats that, it goes into all of their body tissues. It goes into their bones, it goes into their hair, it goes into their muscles, it goes into blood, it goes into their It particularly goes into their teeth and it goes into their enamel. And what we can do is we can take an animal, another African reference, this is a kudu. We can take an animal like a kudu and we can take its tooth and take a tiny little rotor, like a Dremel that you would buy at Home Depot and put a diamond bit on it and you can drill the enamel out of it. And you can figure out what that animal is eating during its life. The reason we care about it in teeth is that teeth are so well preserved in the fossil record. And so they provide this opportunity for us to sort of look, get a pretty good idea of what this animal is eating. Was it eating C3 plants or C4 plants? Um, and that's very valuable when you talk about the ecology of a region, and the ecology of the And so this was a student of mine a few years ago. Her name's Elizabeth Noble. She's a graduate student now. Um, working on snakes, which is interesting. 
Um, but what she did is she took mammoth uh, teeth from Clark Quarry and bison latifrons teeth from Clark Quarry and drilled them for their enamel isotopes. An interesting thing that you can do with them is you can serially sample them. And so each one of these spots in this tooth, notice this is not a complete tooth. It's a fragment of a molar plate. We don't destroy normal nice teeth with them. But each one of those is a spot where she has drilled out the enamel, right? And she ran the isotopic analysis to try to figure out what they would mean during this period. So does anybody know why we would drill them like that rather than just drill them? Like one long line. Like tree rings. What? Like tree rings? You can think about it like tree rings, right? Teeth form in a sequential way. And so each one of these samples records a different period in the mammoth's life. And so what we wanted to know is did they change their diet throughout their life? Did they not change their diet? What was their diet throughout their life? And so we'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing that she did is she pooled a tremendous amount of data from Florida mammoth and bison localities. And the question was, is do you see a vegetation change from Florida up through Georgia? Because currently you do. Currently you move from sort of this grass, open grassland area of Florida up into these forested environments in South Georgia, and it gets even more forested as you go north, right? And so she found that this was the case in bison and mammoth from across the Southeast. And so this pattern that you see now has its roots in the late Pleistocene. That pattern of increasing C3 vegetation or trees as you move northward was there in the late Pleistocene as well. So that's what this is. So latitude is here. These are grasses up here, trees here. So as you go north, you get more trees, which is really interesting because nobody knew that prior to her analysis. Okay. When you look at those serially sampled um, teeth and you plot them based on the distance from the root, you're basically recording different periods of that animal needs. And so on this side of the graph, it would be early periods. On that side of the graph, it would be later periods because they're gonna form from the root to the crane. And so when you look at carbon isotopes, they don't really do too much, right? And so pretty much that entire, the entire life of that animal, they were eating some mixture of C3 and C4 vegetation which interestingly is exactly what elephants do in Africa today, right? Um, oxygen isotopes, I didn't really give a depiction of that, but oxygen isotopes tell you about the body water of an organism. And so what you drink, the plants that you eat, they all have water in them. And so oxygen isotopes record that. Typically, when you see them bounce up and down like this, that means it was a very seasonal environment because when water gets evaporated versus when it's you know cooler outside, you end up with a different oxygen isotope, oxygen isotopic signature because different isotopes move in and out. So we know that there was a latitudinal vegetation gradient, and we know that it was seasonal in coastal Georgia when these animals were. It's seasonal there now, but this suggests that it was more seasonal. So the up and down is representing the season. Yep. So going up and down like that. So like this, so if you can't listen to that, but like this is the axis for the blue line. So when it goes up, it's warm. When it goes down, it's cold, right? And so when it bounces up and down like that, you're looking at seasonal environments. Which is interesting because it is seasonal there now, but when you compare this to some African seasonality data from places that are highly seasonal, it looks more like that. Much more seasonal than it is currently in Brunswick. Okay. And the other thing that you see is that it was generally cooler in Brunswick than it was in Florida localities, right? And so you see the red dots, they are um, Clark Quarry Brunswick data. These are all Florida data. Notice that they are in the range of more grasses here and that they are warmer, which makes sense because grasses grow in warm climates. So it was probably cooler and more seasonal at Clark. That's all I'm going to talk about isotopes <laughs> before I bore you all. We do have some pollen data. I included this here because I think it lends a little bit of credence to our interprets of the interpretation of the isotopes. And so these are pollen data from Clark Quarry. 
Interestingly, we have a pretty good concentration of fir trees during this period. And so, as you probably know, as archaeologists, pollen, uh, pollen morphology is usually distinct to a particular family of, of different types of plants. There are no fir trees in coastal Georgia now. Fir trees are sort of a northern type of thing. But during the late Pleistocene, there were fir trees in coastal Georgia, which lends credence to our oxygen isotopes that suggest it was cooler, right? Um, this is extremely preliminary. We have a lot more pollen data to collect. Um, we're also going to be doing pollen isotopes on different grains. Okay. So, this is a, a different image of the same thing that you saw earlier, but what we've been able to do is sort of build out these paleo landscape models. And <laughs> Chris created this. I know it looks like a bunch of icebergs, but it's not, it's not an iceberg. Um, these are elevate, these are exaggerated elevation measures. And so you see that the canal is coming through here, right? This is the airport, right? From the earlier thing. Um, I'll talk about it in a moment, but last, we were actually in the field last week, one of my other students, Atticus, who's here. We dug lots of um, cores, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but Clark Quarry is here. We found a lot more fossil sites up in here in cores. We found bones in cores. We found the exact same sequence um, using this type of thing. So sort of navigating around the landscape based on these very minor changes in elevation. So when you Think about elevation on the coast, a huge change is a meter, right? It's not a lot, right? And so when you exaggerate them, it allows you to sort of um, see the depositional dynamics a little better. Um, this is a fence diagram that we started putting together based on our uh, different cores. Um, so Clark Quarry is here, right? So this, you'll recognize this, this is soil carbonate, um, a different type or clayish soil than more clay. And then you have this yellow layer that is fossiliferous sand, right? And as we move, you know, 1400 meters, I think to the north, you see that sand sort of tracing. But the reason that this is so big here is because we didn't have a lot of data, right? Um, but we do know that this sandy unit extends over. And so what we're doing now is using the pale paleo landscape model and the cores that I'll mention in a second. Um, define those new fossil sites. And so this, these are hot off the press. This is last week. <laughs> uh, so this is our team there. Um, you probably recognize this guy. This guy came and gave a brag talk. I think his name Russell Cutts. Yeah. So he's, uh, he probably built a fire somewhere and yeah. smoked up a place. In the auditorium building. Yeah, right. Yeah, he, he's done that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe he hasn't been arrested yet. But <laughs> anyways, he was there. And so this is Atticus. This is Philip. And so what we did over the past, last week, is we basically took this entire swath here and put in 40 cores in that area because we wanted to figure out the extent of that fossil layer. Where did it start? Where did it stop? And with those cores, we found tons of new localities that have the exact same sequence as Clark Quarry and fossils in the core. And so now what we can do is we can... Um, better target some of those localities for new excavations. Um, we also figured out, so if if you were familiar with the UGA Science Library before it was sort of revamped, there was a giant ground sloth skeleton in the Science Library. That giant ground sloth skeleton came from the brunswick Altamont Canal. Um, they actually found three skeletons in the area and that was just one of them. The rest of them went to the Smithsonian. Um, we relocated the lo locality where that was down. So now we're going to go back and do more excavations there. Um, okay, that's all I got. So we are moving forward and figuring out the paleo landscape during the late Pleistocene on coastal Georgia using lots and lots of different pro proxies. It's been um, quite the challenge for a host of reasons. So, so, so this is me again. This is what it looks like to work there. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty terrible sometimes. Um, but hopefully we're going to keep, keep moving forward. Um, do you guys have any questions? How far are you able to get down there? Which street? Um, 
Ideally, I would get down there four or five times a year, but currently it's probably three. Pretty good. Yeah. Third question. Sure. What kind of core are you using for these cores? And are you going, did it say about approximately four feet down? Four meters like four down. Four meters down? So yeah, four meters down. So we're using a hand auger. It is, like an oak field? Yeah. And like you're just hammering it down, you don't have any twisting it. That's why I guess was <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's a lot. We did forty and how many days I guess three, three days. Forty of them going down. It, you know, some of them were they were way yeah. Where you run out of extensions. <laughs> yeah. And the problem, the problem with it, this Atticus Ford test, is that in a lot of these places we were digging, it's just straight clay. And so you're hand augering through clay, yeah. pulling it up, having to get it out of the auger yeah. is a terrible problem. Um, and so we did that for for three three days straight. We did forty, but it's really the when you look at that space, like you can you is can do a split split order. Um, so like two or three quarters or whatever it is. Yeah, it's open and then it has a little drill thing on the end of it. Yeah. And then you can pull it out and you pop out the, the barrel. Yeah, the barrel. Yeah. So but the, the thing is, is like when you look at this space, these paleo landscape models are great, right? I mean, they tell you potentially some elevation stuff, but you can't really figure out what's going on until you see the setup. Yeah. And so early on, I think I figured out that it was not going to be feasible to dig one by one pits mm -hmm. two meters in the current or two by one pits. Yeah. We started doing that and we would go down for like, couple days and we do like three pits, right? But the beauty of a pit, as you all know, is that you get really high resolution information out of it, much better than an auger. But we sort of pivoted a few years ago, we pivoted into an auger because you can just cover so much more space. And so we went all like all the way up into here, you know, all the way up into here doing auger, doing hand augers. But the reason we were able to target things is because of the paleo landscape model. So we think that this is what it should look like, but now we can use this and say, okay, this looks low and it probably is where this channel went. And so now we can go there and we can actually do a, so you, the combination of the two is, that's really nice. We used to call those big pits post on phone phone loops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had them collapse on it. So it's, it's, oh, not well, it's not good. It's not good. Put a wall for that. Yeah. 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 And all the, Tech pits and digging that's been done going back to 1838. Have they ever found any human evidence of tools or anything on the site, or is it not? It? No. Well, so I think that in the 1830s, I don't. Know. I don't know what they found. Literally, the the only record they have is a couple of paragraphs in a publication in 1838, and then a couple of sentences in Lyell's work. Um, until we started moving out from Clark Quarry, there really haven't been a lot of, um, at least our team hasn't done it. Um, I know that the Federal Law Enforcement uh, Training Center has brought in archaeologists to do sort of like the upper layers. I don't believe they found anything, which is surprising. <laughs> but um, there just hasn't been a heck of a lot of work because it is really a pain to work there because, you know, in the, this is the first time I've ever been in the winter. Normally it's all summer. Um, and it is so much more pleasant. All the vegetation is down, bugs aren't, bugs are there, but they're not as bad. <laughs> um, but most of the year it's pretty pitiful to work at this part. Yeah. Is this, um, your finds, are they, do they suggest that there's a concentration of deposits and fossils in a, in a band, like a like off, off of a beach, yes. in a trench? And how how long is this band? Does it run up the time down the shelf? That is a really good question, and it could. <laughs> and so the reason that so I'm interested in the fossils. I got roped into all this geology stuff just because I wanted to find more fossils. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons that Chris is really interested in this is that these back barrier estuary and environments run all the way up to the eastern seaboard. But they haven't been investigated from a paleontological perspective really at all. 
And so what we've been trying to do is basically create a systematic way to do that in other places. And so ideally, you could take this combination of methods and move up the eastern seaboard because we know when the ocean was at a certain place here, it was probably approximately the same place. You know, barrier islands run all the way up in South Carolina and all North Carolina. And so these deposits exist, but there hasn't been a lot of paleontological exploration, mostly because... Um, I mean, generally, there just hasn't been a lot of paleontological so, exploration in the southeast. The fossils that you're recovering, do they suggest, because of the concentration, does that suggest a mass extinction die out in a very quick fashion? I don't. I think that probably what, like, if you look at, so one of my advisors was um, a, a famous eponymist for African stuff. And so she's done some work uh, in Kenya. And if you go to a river and you go to a point bar, not the cut bank, but the other side, and you dig down into that point bar, frequently there are bones in that point bar. Um, that could be because the animals go there and they die. It could be because that's where the low energy comes around and deposits them. And so within these sort of meandering streams that you see in here, there are places that do concentrate bones because as they go, as the sediment moves slowly, they sort of drop out in particular places. What it looks like at that site is that you have a, you, you remember the mammoth in articulation, that you probably had an animal that was dead on the landscape. It was covered, but it was just sort of like a sand, a sand sort of quick low energy that sort of just moved it a little bit, but didn't take one bone and strow it a kilometer down the beach. And so you probably had, and the reason that Cooper and Lyell found bones at multiple spots running up here is because they were sampling those point bars of that braided stream with the canal as they moved through. And so sometimes you would hit them at the point bar, then you would move on and you'd probably be somewhere else in the river. Then you would come back to a point bar and hit them there again. So but probably not like a mass die-off. These are natural type things, I would think. Yeah. Well, considering the fir trees you said were present then, uh, we know they're in the northern latitudes now, mm -hmm. uh, above the hardwoods. Mm -hmm. So what would you say the temperature difference was back then compared to now? I don't know. I, I mean, I think, I think you'd have pretty cold winters, um, but I think you would also have fairly mild summers. You know, I think it was pretty highly seasonal. Um, a lot of people have used, um, you know, the biogeography of, of different trees to come up with average temperatures. Um, maybe they're the same in the past, maybe not. Um, I Probably significantly colder, which is not a good answer. Pretty cold. <laughs> yeah. But, uh... I'm just thinking about the preservation. You get some really good mm -hmm. pockets of organic preservation. Mm -hmm. Is it anaerobic environment, quick burial? Or I think it's quick. Or... Yeah. So if you go, oh, it's pretty far away. Back. So this sand. So if you go out to like, and once we started doing this work, I have never thought about sand as much as I've thought about it with this project. <laughs> because I used, and when I worked in Africa, we would just sort of walk on outcrops to pick up fossils and stuff. But if you look here, you have these sort of color changes. Like if you're sitting in a beach chair on the beach and you stick your hand in the sand, that is what this grayish sand feels like, super fine. This sand is basically reworked beach sand that got incorporated into a riverine type slow energy environment. It is minuscule, but it is slightly larger grain size than that beach scene. And so it looks like, um, if you're familiar with like a, uh, like if you have a, a river on the coast and it, and it floods, often what will happen is it'll break its bank and have just sort of a sand sheet that shoots over the bank. And it's just basically a massive amount of sand that just gets dumped in a place. That is sort of what it looks like because they're, you know, geologically there are no sort of like cross beds in it. There are no um, banding patterns or anything like that. It looks like you just like 
threw a bucket of sand <laughs> into a particular place. Um, but because these bones have not been moved over great distances, I would imagine that it's a fairly quick, quick burial, um, relatively low energy. And I think because the sand grains are so fine, you end up with really good preservation of the bone because there are no gra there's no gravels, there's no anything because on the coast you just don't have gravels in the river. Yeah. So you mentioned the carbonate early. Yeah. You said it was like, but it was interesting conversation. So what what that depending? It's inter Well, one, it's it's interesting because it's a huge pain to dig through, <laughs> as you can imagine. The we're still working on it. Because what can happen, and some of these cores and additives can attest to it, is that in some places you'll find the clay goes all the way down to this sand, and then you don't have that carbonate layer. In other places, you do have that carbonate layer. And so the only thing that we can figure is that when this was being deposited, you have these low areas that were holding water that were probably pretty evaporative, and all of the all of the carbonate in the water just sort of sunk down to the bottom. Um, and so across this whole space, you have these carboning areas that are probably the remnants of these little pond-like structures that get evaporated out and their carbonate stays and they get covered by soil. Um, we've dated for, we've dated this whole sequence and some of these, you know, this, the, these are in the 5,000 year-ish range, um, which is interesting archaeologically, but um, we have not found any, you know, artifacts or any anything like that. And I have been looking for them. Most paleontologists don't look for them. I have definitely been looking for them, um, and I haven't. I haven't seen any anywhere down there. You do find a lot of trash where people have just dumped old chairs and all kinds of stuff in. There. Any other questions? Thank you, Dan. No, thank you. Thanks for having me.